Hi, I'm Bruce Halker with Capital Collision Center, also a board member with SCRS. Uh, we're here to talk about some of the confusion um, between scanning and calibration. Uh, Jason, can you kind of go through that for us? Yeah, certainly there's been, I think, a lot of confusion out in the industry about uh, some of the terminology that we're quite frequently hearing about pre-scanning, post-scanning, and one term that isn't brought up nearly as much as I think it needs to be is this post-repair calibration. Uh, I think a lot of times all three of those terms are being lumped into one bucket um, when that certainly is not the case. Uh, certainly the pre-scanning, uh, part of that blueprinting damage analysis process to identify uh, what might be what might be wrong with the car, both related and unrelated to the collision. Uh, Post-scanning, certainly to clear codes, make sure that before we hand the keys back to the customer, uh, the codes that we're able to identify um, have been cleared and might entail a, a, a test drive of the vehicle as well. And then post-repair uh, post repair calibration, again, I think is the area that we need to start spending more time talking about because all these advanced uh, driver assist systems like uh, collision mitigation, uh, lane departure warning, lane keep assist, uh, adaptive cruise control, uh, all those have specific procedures related to post-repair calibration that's not just as simple as the post-scanning part of it. Uh, so I think those are three terms and those are three areas that uh, we at ICAR are trying to focus on a little bit more, trying to get some definitions and have been meeting with the industry to kind of develop some, some definition around each of those so we're all kind of on, the, on a level playing field. Um, but I do think there's been some, some confusion about uh, each of those terms and they're starting to get used interchangeably and incorrectly interchangeably. You know, Jason, some of the confusion that exists, you, again, you mentioned that what, what we see is basically is that there's, a, there, there's an anticipation that you can lump all vehicles, all issues into one when in reality you can't. The bottom line is you have to follow all the OEM recommendations or requirements because now I mean, we're seeing more and more, more of them. Even as something as simple as, and, uh, and again, just get your opinion on it or your, or, or your research, I guess would be the best way to say it. When you have a car just as simple as one that you pulled an interior trim panel off or one that you just pulled the front bumper cover off to refinish it, just simply as that. Are you seeing in your scanning or, or the cars you've worked on, because I know you've worked on a lot of them as well, are you seeing that they're de developing a DTC uh, that is uh, part of the accident? Or part of the repair it, process. You know, it could be part of the repair process, could be part of the accident, certainly again pre-existing uh, sure, damage, uh, existing um, conditions that might be in there, and, and damage to mounting locations. Um, again, if you've got a sensor that needs to be pointed in the right location, and that, dam that mounting location is, is improper, um, that could potentially adversely affect it as well. So there's uh, a number of different things that could certainly um, put codes in the vehicle, but not everything's even putting a DTC into the system. Uh, again, a lot of these calibrations might not even set a code. Um, certainly we know that a lot of these DTCs that are being set aren't illuminating a mill lamp on, on the dash. Um, another area of confusion, I think that a lot of people think, well, there's no, there's no lights on the dash, therefore everything must, be, everything must be okay. Well, that may not necessarily be the case and really the only way to identify if that DTC is in there is, is to scan the vehicle. And again, even with some of these, these parts, if you're replacing some of these cameras, um, they may not set a code and I think back to many years ago when I first learned about occupant classification systems from um, when I was, we were uh, with the Equipment and Tool Institute, ETI, at Chrysler, the first time I, the first time I heard the term strain gauges um, related to OCS. Um, you remove the seat, put the seat back in, you have to calibrate that OCS system, but it didn't turn a light on. Right. So there would, there was, and that was relatively new to me at the time, like you know, how can I not have a light on if there's you know, some kind of indicator? Um, and that's the world we live in. There's so many different systems on these vehicles that there's not enough room for, right, for all for these, for all these yeah. lights and dashes, and they can be sometimes kind of hard to find as well. So I don't know if you're seeing similar things out. Uh, well, I wanted to school. point out something a little differently, is that <laughs> with these vehicles today, um, the center line being center of the car is so critical because these systems all work off the center line of the car. And if we're not pre-measuring the cars, and post-measuring and checking that center line, uh, these systems could be all inoperative. And I think that is, goes hand in hand with scanning, is that we need to make sure that our cars are totally straight now. And the other part of this, the scenario is, you know, cars get hit in the left front, the right rear's moving. And 
with today's trying to get these cars out faster uh, on, a, on a KPI, we're not looking at, well, we're just looking at the damage in the front. We'll measure just the front because that's where it was hit and not worrying about the rear. And then next thing you know, you have the rear out of alignment and your rear radar is, as Jason just pointed out, has to be at a certain angle, at a certain height, and it's off because the car's moved in the back. So we as repairs need to take a look at the whole system. And scanning is such an important thing because of liability factors um, that light doesn't show up. Yeah, and, and you mentioned the, the, the center line, make sure that the, the vehicle's seeing what it needs to see. Um, you know, I think about like a, a scope for a rifle. You know, you, you go and buy a nice new scope at, uh, at your local hunting, fishing store, and you can look through that scope and see everything perfectly fine. Crosshairs look good. Well, the first thing you do when you put that on your, on your rifle is you, you aim that to make sure that's going the right direction. You know, you think about, you know, one degree or one millimeter off, you know, height-wise at, at the scope isn't a big deal. But when it's 250 or 300, 500 yards out, you've got a huge issue. So now instead of missing your target, that camera maybe is now not seeing the target that's in front of it when you're traveling on the road at, you know, 70 miles an hour, um, obeying the speed limit, of course. Um, you know, the, the issue, so it, it, it's very important to make sure that you're, you're calibrating, because the camera doesn't know, it's, it's plugged in, the system you know, says, hey, everything seems to be functioning, and uh, it may not set a code, but you still, you need to have that calibration uh, to take place. Well, let's talk a little something else, is that cars come in and no codes are showing. And uh, let's say I'm changing a window with lane watch, a front windshield, and you have the camera in the, right in the center there, and now you put that windshield back in, and it might be at a cockeyed angle, and the reflection will have a, have a drastic effect, and now I'll set a code. Even one step farther, we go back with Honda, you remove the right mirror because of lane watch, and now it has to be recalibrated. Now, the, you know, it's got a triple code, that's fine, and that's part of the, the uh, scan part, but now you have to recalibrate it. That's the second part, which uh, Jason was alluding to, and we seem to forget these things. And again, having that knowledge up front, when you write that sheet, um, we don't need supplements. And if you don't have that knowledge and you start, put, well, gee whiz, this isn't working. Well, there's no light on the dash. Well, we'll send it out. Now you have some other real huge liability problems. Um, I think, you, I think you, you, know, you look at that and you go, Bruce, how many times have you, the car's ready to go? It's Friday, it's three o'clock. You and your guys are, and gals are getting ready, ready to deliver this car back to Miss Jones. All of a sudden, someone in detail or wherever, rear, they, they, look, they look and see there's a light, light on the dash. How nice wouldn't that be to know that up front and then not have to upset the customer, not have to, to know that, oh geez, you know, what happened? I'm sure it's never happened in your shop, has it? Well, you're right, it's never happened in my shop, but I've heard about it. <laughs> right, um, right. One of the things that, that we find a lot in our shop is uh, the codes that get set during the repair process and making sure at the end of the repair that those are cleared and you know some of the uh, misunderstandings in that or when you plug them items back in they'll clear themselves that that doesn't happen that uh, um, so I, I think that you know to get some of that out there too is is very important and I think totally mentioned a very important part with the glass you know a lot of these cameras are mounted the glass and they've got, even if the camera in that particular system isn't damaged, you take that glass off and mount that camera on a new one, it requires that calibration. And it, it goes even beyond there. Uh, we did an iCar 360 video on a Ford F-150 and talking about the, uh, the, the camera system on that particular vehicle. And it was more than just the glass, but if you change the size of the tires, um, you know, and, and, people, oh, and, pe and people do that, and, yeah. you know, and it might not be a lot of trucks, you know, in Southern California necessarily, but uh, in Wisconsin there certainly is. And, they like to, uh, they put different size tires on them. And, and I know other ones, if you do a, a suspension alignment, calibration requires some of these systems. So I think having access to the OEM information is, is paramount. Um, it always is. Um, the thing about the, the calibrations of some of this information is it's not in areas where, where we're typically looking. We're not looking in the same areas. We're looking for sectioning information, material identification. Uh, repairability guidelines, it's, we have to kind of learn again how to find this information uh, in the OEM and service information to find out exactly what needs to be done um, for these particular systems from a calibration standpoint. Well, how do, you have, how do you know unless you scan it? 
Yeah, but even beyond that, so again, because some of these, these systems aren't going to bring up a code even if you're scanning, if you're just replacing it, it's a matter of identifying, does this vehicle have this system? Okay, it's got this system. I've, um, we, the collision um, was you know, in the area where part of that system might be affected, so I might have parts that I have to replace, or again, even the glass, glass scenario, um, it may or may not set a code. Uh, so again, find that information, identify. If I remove this camera, does it require calibration? Um, would be important to, again, to know up front when you're writing that, that sheet uh, to make sure that you're capturing all that and accounting for it and if it needs to be sent down to the dealership or if you need to bring somebody in or even to plan your internal staff to be able to calibrate that towards the end of the week before that vehicle is delivered um, would, be, would be great to know that up front. I, th I think, you know, we've talked about the confusion that, that it exists within, in the, within the industry because obviously this has taken us all by storm. It just seems like it just happened overnight when, you know, when if you look at what the OEMs have been saying as far as what they've been bringing out as far as their, their requirement that this has to be done. This isn't something that's happened overnight, it's just that with the, 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 you know, the position statements or the, or the actual statement has come, has come forward. I guess the main question we, that we all have to ask ourselves is when we're when we're doing a scan or when we bring a vehicle in, just when we think it's a, a light hit or a, or a small hit, or not, that's, that's almost, it's part of the equation, but it's almost irrelevant because it's, okay, what, what is the repair plan that consists of? Because like we said, you know, you're refinishing a front bumper that may or may not have sensors in it. So you're refinishing that bumper, you have to pull out the sensors, you have to disconnect it from the car. Well, that's gonna trigger it. To your point, it may or may not show a code. I think where a lot of the confusion lies is that, okay, how do I know that this this code came from this accident? You know, and and if you know Toby or or, or Jason, if you guys could elaborate when you're doing a scan and you're seeing, I mean, it time. Time dates it stamps it right. Is that is that fair to say that that, that when when and it happened? You know, and, and I don't know if it always happens. Sure. Um, and again, if there's been power disabled to the vehicle, it may, may lose some of those history codes. Sure. Um, but it's all kind of, again, gathering all that different evidence and kind of trying to figure out what, what actually took place. Right. And again, using the collision advantage of where was the vehicle hit, what systems it does have. You know, and and uh, conversely to your point a little while ago about the bumpers, there are also some that you can just unplug and plug back in and everything's fine. But again, you don't know unless you're right. doing that research and trying to find out exactly what that particular system does because no, you know no two vehicles are built alike believe it or not and uh, agreed <laughs> agreed yeah and, and and that's the hotbed of the issue is is that that because that because this is new we're all trying to find a way around it you know as far as you know what's our what's our role in this and 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 we're trying to bring that information forward and of course there's i mean you take even some dealers some dealers that don't know that you need, you need to do it. So, you know, that's how, how new that how new this is. So we know we're going to have that level of confusion. Uh, that's why it's good that we share that. And, and, and it's easier to sit down and go over it than it is to do it at the scene of the car or at the car itself. What is, when, it, when it comes down to the types of scanners that are, that are out there, would you, would you mind going, going, going over as far as like types of scanners? Uh, uh, what's, you know, some companies so out there? Again, we're not promoting anything. Scanners. I mean, there's uh, OEM scanners. You go to the dealer and they have proprietary information. You have aftermarket scanners, you know, uh, Bosch, uh, OTC, uh, Snap-on all have those. There's good, good things about them and there's not so good thing. Maybe we should talk a little about those. And now you have something relatively new is these uh, internet connection scanners. And they have somebody who's on the other end of the receiving end who can read all your codes for you and send you out a, a sheet. So, I mean, these are the three areas that we have. And they're using scanner. a lot of, uh, they're, they're using some OEM. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're, they're using, supposed they've to got be. master technicians that are familiar with that OEM equipment and uh, they're using those remote uh, tools as a, an interface between the vehicle and um, those OEM scan tools. Well, I saw a demonstration where we were up in Northern California and a car had just come back from an Audi dealer for four days uh, that they couldn't, f they said the alarm was fixed and we plugged in and the technician on the other side said, was this car in an accident? He said, yes. He says, your alarm's not working. How do you know that? Well, there's no code set. He said, by any chance, did you change the left rear quarter panel? <laughs> yes. 
Well, check the ground from the uh, gas door lock. It's off. We put it in, cleared the codes, done. So, I mean, there's a lot of advantages having that tool available to you. You know, one, one question, Mary, that I get quite often is, you know, what, what scan tool should I buy? Um, and I don't, there's, I don't think there's an easy answer to that. Um, you know, at the Toby's point, they've all got, you know, pros and cons per se. Um, but what I always tell people is, you know, kind of look at what is your, what's the model lineup, the make, what make of vehicles are you working on? You know, you have a high percentage of one particular make versus another, um, you know, and you can kind of start going from there and then start again doing thorough research, figuring out what that scan tool can do. Um, as part of this post repair calibration um, definition that we put together with the industry, um, one of the OEMs said, you know, make sure that you've got a, a, a tool that's capable of performing the task that it needs to perform. So I think, again, thorough research uh, on that end. I think, again, looking at what is that model lineup that you're working on, because if you're working on, you know, 20% of this make and, you know, 30% of that make, maybe it makes sense to, to get a couple of OEM scan tools and then maybe you're looking to look at an aftermarket scan tool or working with you know, Air Pro Diagnostics or Collision Diagnostic Services in their Aztec II, you know, for remote scanning for some of the other things. Um, so I don't think there's, there's no easy answer um, to that particular question about what tool is best for me. I think it's going to be a case-by-case -case basis that each, each repair facility is going to have to really take a, a, a detailed look at their repair orders and kind of figure out what they're going to be, what's going to be best for them. So with all the different scanners on the market, both aftermarket, the OE ones, ones that are portable and, and used over the internet in the shops, is there a different skill set that goes into being able to use these and use them to their entirety? Yeah, well, I, I certainly think it's, it certainly is a skill set that a lot of us in the collision industry aren't as familiar with. Um, it, a whole new learning curve, I think, um, which is an area I think that we need to start paying more attention to as, as, as industry representatives looking for career and technical schools and colleges to start getting this into their curriculum, um, you know, actively voicing our opinions in, in advisory committees and making sure that they're coming out with uh, not only the basic, you know, electronic fundamentals, but also how to use different scan tools, some of these different procedures. Because uh, that tool really, again, is, is only as good as uh, the person on the other end of it. And if they're just, you know, just, you can't just look up the code. There's you know, a number of different steps that are going to have to take place potentially after that. You might have to follow some flow charts, look through some, you know, do some diagnostics and a little bit deeper dive diagnostics and make some measurements and try to identify. Now, fortunately, again, we often deal with cut wires and pinched wires and sensors and cameras that are, you know, flat out broken. Uh, we have that to our advantage. You know, my question is some of these, we've talked about some of the tools that are available and some of them you said are based over the internet. So I think one of the misconceptions I've seen is, is that those tools, albeit, you know, the, a lot of the information is transferred re remotely, there's still a technician at the location of the business that has to go through the process. Exactly. Man, can you talk a little bit about yeah, that? You're exactly right. So yeah, the, the, you've got the scan tool on one end, but again, you still have a technician back in, in your facility that's gonna need to know, okay, now that we've got this particular condition, now we need to figure out what that means and I need to repair that condition. Um, it, it, it can't all happen remotely. And, and even if you take the vehicle for a test drive, you know, is, is that feasible with, with all that equipment? You know, it may or may not be. Um, so again, some of these calibrations require you to be at a certain speed for a certain period of time. And maybe in those cases, maybe, maybe a remote diagnostic uh, piece of equipment may not work. You know, I, I don't know. Um, it just, but it's something again, all these different factors that need to go into, into, the, into those conversations. Well, here's another factor you got to think about. Uh, technician moves the car over to the area, plugs in, and he's sitting around waiting for them to send back the information. Uh, is this person going to get, are we going to pay for this person? I mean, these are some of the, another question that needs to be answered. Um, well, and when you move that vehicle too, you might be putting additional codes into it. Is, is, that, is that correct? It, it can be if the car isn't totally put together. Um, oftentimes, if there's something that has been removed and the vehicle's moved with that part off there, it, it will trip other codes. So, Jason, when you see, and I hate to keep coming back to you, but again, I know based upon things you've had a lot of talks with the with the uh, you know with the folks that, that, that had the intermediary or the internet based uh, uh, di the diagnostics how do you see as far as if you have a 
an in-house scan tool. So one of the ones like Toby had referenced, whether it's Snap-on or Bosch or OTC or whomever, it's a different skill set of the technician. I mean, the way we do it, we actually we, we actually rely on our mechanical staff to handle this because there's a lot of information that a lot of our body tech staff is not that has not been set up or trained on yet. So it seems to be a natural fit from our side to, to you know to do that. So it's one thing to look at it and see what's wrong with the vehicle, okay, from your, after you've done your pre-scan to see it. It's another, th it, it, it's another thing to actually do something with it. Okay, so now I've got this information, what do I do with it? And, 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 and just curious as to what's your thoughts and, and yours too, Toby, as far, as far as once you print, you, you, you've, you've printed it out, at some point you have to make the choice, hey, can I do this in-house or do I need to re refer this? Um, can, it, can, you, can you guys kind of give us some thoughts on, 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 what some, on what some of the indicators are as to whether you keep it or, or move or move? Well, again, I think it's going to depend on exactly, it's going to be a shop to shop condition. You know, what, what types of tools, equipment do you have there? What type of expertise do you have there with your technicians? Um, is it, a, is it, a, is it a, a new system that you've never dealt with before that, you know, that you may not even know it existed sure. on a particular model? Um, and so I think it's, it's, it's going to be a huge learning curve here for a while um, and I think we'll get up to speed hopefully relatively quickly uh, on it we'll start seeing a lot more technicians there but I think it's it's all part of that repair plan that repair process and and that decision making because it's, it's not the only thing you might have to send it to somebody else you might have to call them for glass installation or if you don't do a lot of your own restraint work potentially um, but just another factor to, to add to the ever-growing list of, of things to consider I think I go one step farther is proprietary equipment. You know, you might have come up with these, these things that need to be uh, repaired, but the tools are only available through an OE, and some of them might even say to the point, we're not gonna allow you to have the tool, it has to come to our dealership. Right. So. so then, I mean, it's definitely possible, Bruce, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, where you could actually scan the vehicle in-house get it to you know do what you can do to it per se and there may be something to Toby's point that you can't do so then you're actually going through those motions twice we have to still send and Bruce have you ever you ever had anything like that happen yeah and, and that becomes kind of a, a, a tougher situation as far as um, reimbursement from the bill payer too sure. um, and and honestly I get that yeah, I think you know the education piece of it obviously with iCar we're working on some courses right now Another tool that we're working on is, again, we've had some repairability summits on collision repair diagnostics. We've got those base definitions now that um, are now published on the ICAR repairability technical support website. And the next tool that we're working on is going to be a post repair calibration requirements um, matrix, very similar to our, our restraint system and our partial part replacement search. You'll have put the make, model, and year of the vehicle and it will tell you which vehicle ha that vehicle might be equipped with. We're not going to be able to go down to your individual vehicle, uh, but as uh, we're going to start with 2016 models and we'll move into 2017 and beyond. Don't know that we'll make it back to 2015s and 14s anytime soon, but at least letting people know that, hey, this 2016 Honda Civic might be equipped with these advanced driver assist systems, and if this condition is met, you're going to have to do a post repair calibration on that. So at least what we've got because again, that only information, um, is, it can be a challenge to find. I mentioned that iCar 360 video that we put together on the F-150. I spent about eight hours just to try to find all the calibration requirements for that one particular vehicle. Uh, so what we're trying to do with the, the RTS team is help the industry do some of that research and then make that information available. So at least if we identify, hey, this has got some damaged glass on it, we recognize that it's got a camera in there, is there a calibration required? Is there a scan tool required? And is there any you know, special aiming or targets required? And will it also set a mill and a DTC? So we're trying to do a lot of that research so we can get everybody in the same, the same playing field so we understand, okay, what are we dealing with? And at least here, we've got this OEM information at our fingertips, and now we can make some, some, um, some effective decisions on our best course of action, plan accordingly, figure out if we sublet it, if we need to get some targets for, for aiming these systems. So we're gonna try to do a lot of that, and that will be available uh, very shortly on the uh, on the RTS website at icar.com slash RTS. A little plug for our, my, my great team back in Apple. Jason, I know you had an unfortunate incident with your brand new vehicle, but uh, you know, if you look at, if you look at, it's not just the scanning, but it's also having the tooling. Again, and I, I, I generically coat that because 
again, just on, you know, just on the, 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 the length to departure. There's some that require a stand with the, the, with the color code, and then there's some that want it lay, you know, on, that's on the ground. This is, you know, we are an industry that's not used to pulling OEM repair data. I think we can all agree on that. It's sad, but it's true, and I'm, hey, I'm just as part of, our, part, I'm just as part of the problem. But going forward and even backwards, but going forward, definitely, we've got to do it. We've got to get out of that habit of assuming that we know how to do it or that I can just, or I did it on this car this way, so I'm bound to be able to do it with this one. It is every car, every OE, and then even different procedures with every OE within different car lines. And so you know, you, we have to look up that information. And, on, and honestly, your site is a great site to, you know, to go to, you know, to, and I think, from a video standpoint, you know, you, 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 again, you guys have some great stuff on there, but how do you convey to everyone that this isn't just a flash in the pan? This isn't just something that's here now, someone's gonna invent a tool next week that's gonna make this go away. How do you convey to everyone that, that, that this is what, you know, is this a culture shift? You've gotta do this, you've gotta look this up. It, I think it's, it's communication with the industry, it's outreach through your events, through ICAR events, through SEMA, um, you know, through other industry events and getting the word out there, getting more technicians uh, involved in it. But one of the challenges with that is not everybody's going to these different industry events. It's, you know, it, no offense to you, but everywhere I go, I see you. I don't right. see a lot of other people that, that, a good that, thing, by the way. that, that, aren't, that aren't as invested as you are and, and you guys are involved, you know, in the industry. And it's how do we reach them, um, you know, and I, I think if we can continue to work together and share the information through different communication channels, um, ultimately we'll, we'll be successful. But I mean, we still, you know, we mentioned welding. I mean, we still have troubles conveying the importance of, you know, good quality welds to some areas and measuring, you know, we still have, you know, potentially vehicles that aren't being repaired with, with three-dimensional measuring. You know, so we've, we've got a long, you know, a, a, a tall, tall ladder to climb, but I think we can, we can get there if we kind of all come together uh, for the betterment, and I don't want it to have to be some a tragic situation that rec that re helps the industry realize that you know what we should really be be doing these procedures in our shop. It needs to be we need to be thinking forward enough that we make sure we're, we're giving those keys back to that customer that their vehicle's been repaired. You know, it's complete, safe, quality repair because uh, it is about you know that that consumer and that vehicle and their family. One one of the things that that I see that's a real positive in our industry are more of the OEs getting involved in the repair process and what it takes to properly repair their vehicles. Um, I always wish that more of them would do it, uh, but one of the glitches that we've also ran into are some of the companies that have come out with their uh, position statement on the scans and then their dealerships not knowing anything about it and we'll have a bill payer call a, a dealership and they'll say, well, no, that's not required. Well, we're holding the, the form in our hand, and then it becomes, now they've got an answer from the real guy to get the answer from. So I, I wish the OEs would uh, go a little bit further in the education of their own people and their, their own dealerships. Yeah, it's, and, a, it's an inter-industry-wide <coughs> education piece. It's not just independence. It is dealerships. It's the insurance personnel. It's, it's everybody involved. And you know, I think that your point with the OEMs is, is a great one. You think back, you know, 10, 15 years ago, there weren't a lot of there weren't OEM networks out there. Right. Um, a lot of people that we deal with at the OEM level, um, we didn't they weren't they didn't have as many staff. I mean, I think about back to, to Honda, you know, 10 years ago, we had one person that we dealt with, and now they've got a team of a bunch, you know, that then they do, and they're very forward thinking through their through their program. And and Chris Toby and his team doing a fantastic job, and Lee and and all those guys, and um, I think that that's the OEM networks and that communication, uh, they're recognizing that there's a need for complete safe quality repair. It's, it's, you know, the vehicle's evolved. It's not just an old mild steel vehicle anymore. We've got you know, all the advanced high strength steels, and it's just, it's just, the, next, just the next event in this cycle, and it's gonna continue to evolve, and um, I think people are gonna be, be more aware of that moving forward. We've talked a lot today about tools, equipment, uh, in, in all that goes into it. We've talked, talked about the internet-based tools available. We've talked about the in-house tools from the local distributors. You know, there's still that level of confusion where, you know, we have, and, and, and I know we get calls from shops all the time that say, hey, I've got all this. 
I presented everything to the third party payer, but I'm still getting pushback. I'm still getting the, you know, the, you know, that friction there, or I'm the bad guy because I'm doing it. Jason, you guys at iCar, I mean, I know you field a lot, you know, a ton of calls each day. Are you guys seeing this where, where you're, you're getting calls from carriers, from other shops? Are, are you seeing that a lot or? Yeah, we, we're getting a lot of calls and questions from everybody in the industry and the carriers uh, in, included. Um, uh, we've, we've done a couple of repairability summits. We're gonna continue to repairability summits on closure repair diagnostics. And we've had major carriers at these events. Uh, we've had collision repairs. Uh, again, it's, you know, ICAR being the inter-industry organization it is. We've got collision repairs in, in, involved in this. We've got insurance personnel involved in it. Certainly the scan tool manufacturers uh, involved in it. Uh, other subject matter experts and, and the OEMs as well. Uh, so again, we're trying to make sure that we've got this inter-industry outreach um, and having, uh, you know, again, the, the major carriers at these events is a, certainly a way for them to get educated along with the rest of us as we're having these conversations. And then hopefully it'll trickle down to, uh, to, to everywhere. And you know, I know there's other events going on all across the country. So it's not just the major events that we were you know, kind of you know, joking about earlier, but you know, there's local, you know, local and state associations that are getting together on a frequent basis. And, and I think you know, reaching out to subject matter experts in your particular area and bringing them in to talk about their experiences, um, inviting in, again, not just you know, the association members, but others from the area as well, bring them in and have the same conversation and again, try to educate them all together and uh, whether that be you know, some, a local ICAR instructor or an SCRS representative or uh, Mike Anderson or anybody else in the industry, bringing these people together and bringing these subject matter experts in. I um, you know a lot of people that are willing to, to, to go out and, and do the outreach and, and try to communicate it and uh, we're certainly along with that as well. And um, you know, if anybody's ever got any questions for ICAR, they can you know, certainly feel free to, to contact me directly or go through SCRS and get involved in our repairability summits and our other activities. Um, again, we're trying to do this for the betterment of the industry and we wanna make sure that we're all, again, it's all about complete, safe and quality repairs for the ultimate benefit of the consumer. Thanks for being with us. Uh, we've covered a lot of information today on scans and calibrations, different tools available. Um, if you'd like to know more information, you can visit us on our website, scrs.com.